I mean, God knows who's going to get saved today out soul winning. It doesn't mean that God chooses that some will get saved and chooses to damn others. But, but let me get into the third point. I got to hurry up here. I'm going to blow through these. But this is the one that I don't understand how any Calvinist could ever defend this point. Because it is so unscriptural, it's ridiculous. And that is the point of limited atonement. Yeah. Limited atonement, this is the L in Tulip. They teach that Jesus did not die for everybody. And this is the most unscriptural doctrine. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I mean, there are so many ways to prove this doctrine wrong. And this is where Calvinism falls apart. You know, whenever I talk to a Calvinist, you know, I don't always want to take the time to go into a dissertation on Romans 9 and go back to Genesis 25 and Malachi chapter 1, the first thing I attack is limited atonement because it's just so without basis. I mean, it has no scriptural basis. And whenever you ask them to defend it, what they'll do is just give you logic. They don't have any scripture on limited atonement. They'll just say, well, it just doesn't make sense. I mean, if, if, if Jesus already died for someone's sins, why would they have to die for their sins? That'd be two people dying for the same sins, and that doesn't make sense to me. I don't care whether it makes sense to you. That's what the Bible says. There's a lot of things in the Bible that might not make sense to your human puny brain. I mean, think about it. What about where the Bible says these three are one? I mean, what about when the Bible says, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested. I mean, can you fully wrap your mind around how God could become flesh and dwell among us? I mean, that's difficult to comprehend, right? You know, can you understand how, you know, unto the Son he saith, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Therefore, God, even thy God. You know, I mean, look, these things are deep things of God. And whether or not you understand them doesn't change the fact that they are true Amen. and that the Bible is true. Whether you understand, I mean, how, how can someone be twice dead? But the Bible says they're twice dead. How can someone be twofold more the child of hell? Look, it doesn't matter whether you get it or not. The Bible teaches that Jesus Christ died on the cross for every single person in this world. And you don't have any scripture to say that he didn't. And let me give you some scripture that says that he did. And this limited atonement, it could be based on your logic of double jeopardy or double punishment. But let's read what the Bible says. 1 Timothy 2.3 says this, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. So what is God's will? He will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. It means he wants all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Flip over to chapter 4. Of course, the Calvinist says to this, well, all doesn't mean all. <laughs> and let me show you a list of verses where all doesn't mean all. And let me prove to you that all doesn't mean all. Okay, Calvinist, I know your game. Let's go to 1 Timothy 4.10 and let's see if all doesn't mean all. It says, For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. No, all doesn't really mean all. All is just the elect. All is just the ones that he chooses. All the ones that he wants. Okay, read the next part. Especially of those that believe. Okay, so is he the Savior of those that don't believe? Yes. So look, he's the Savior of all men including those who don't believe because he's because guess what you're not going to believe this all means all okay well all doesn't mean all okay go to Romans 5 and while you're turning there I'll read for you another verse that uses the word all Titus 2 11 says for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men earlier he said if I be lifted up from the earth I will draw all men unto me look what it says in Romans 5 18 because they'll say well all doesn't really mean all Okay, verse 18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Now, this is referring back to Romans 5, 12, where he says, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So I guess when the Bible says for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, all doesn't mean all there either. Or when the Bible says death passed upon all men for that all have sinned, that doesn't mean all either, right? Because look at verse 18 in the same passage. It says, 
For uh, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. I think any Calvinist would agree that that all means all. That we're all condemned, we're all sinners, we're all children of Adam. But look at the next phrase. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So if you're a Calvinist, the all in the first half of the verse, that means all. But the all in the second half of the verse does not mean all because we said so. <laughs> Even though it's the same verse. Look, if all are condemned in the first half of the verse... Why isn't the free gift available to all in the second half of the verse? Because you're a Calvinist, that's why. Because you're rejecting what the Scripture teaches, that's why. Uh, look what the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 2. And while you're turning to Hebrews chapter 2, I'll read for you from 1 John 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The Bible says he's not just the propitiation for our sins, but also for the sins of the whole world. Yep. Now, again, the Calvinists will look at that and say, well, he's just saying our like the Jews. You know, he's not just the propitiation for our sins like Jews, but also for the sins of the whole world. Except that in the entire book of 1 John, five chapters long, he doesn't say anywhere or indicate anywhere that he's even talking to the Jews or about the Jews. I mean, where is that in 1 John where he distinguishes between Jew and non-Jew? That, that doesn't even exist in the book. There's no evidence that he's even writing unto Jews. Okay? I mean, John, you say, well, John, man, he was just with the Jews. But read the three books of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, okay? And look at the people he's talking about. Demetrius, Diotrephes, these don't sound like Jews to me. And not only that, let's think about the big long, what's that big long book that John wrote at the end of the Bible? Revelation, Revelation right. And who did he write it unto? It's all to the Jews, right? No, it's written to the seven churches which are in Asia. Okay, so what, what, what evidence do you have that 1 John is written to the Jews? None. Zero. Nothing. Okay, so therefore to say that that's what John meant is just to just make things up because you don't want to let go of limited atonement. And the Bible says he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. When he says not for ours only, who's he writing to? Believers, the saved. So he's saying he's the propitiation for our sins, the saved, but not just for us, but also for the sins of the whole world. Uh, where did I have you turn? Hebrews 2? Look at verse 9. Since all doesn't really mean all, let's see if every really means every. Hebrews 2, 9. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So did Jesus just die for certain people? I mean, how can you call yourself a Bible-believing Christian and say, I believe the Bible's the Word of God, and then look at this verse, Hebrews 2, 9, and say, Jesus didn't die for everybody. You're a liar is what you are. You're a false prophet is what you are. You don't believe this book. You believe in lies written by man. Whether that man's named John Calvin or whatever his name is, you are believing in lies and heresy. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ tasted death for every man. I believe it. Do you believe it? Anybody who doesn't believe it is rejecting the Bible. They're just rejecting the Bible. I mean, they're just looking at the Bible. It says he tasted death for every man. They just say, nope, he didn't die for everybody. That's a lie. And we've seen how many scriptures... 1 Timothy 2, he said it twice. 1 Timothy 4, Titus chapter 2, Romans 5, Hebrews 2, 1 John 2, he died for all, he died for all, he died for all, he died for all, he died for the world, he died for the world. Every man, every man. Limited atonement. Let me, let me explain to you why two people cannot be punished for the same sin. Shut up, you intellectual fool. You uber intellectual you Dr. Fat Bottom from so-and-so, the seminary, with all your degrees and all your accolades of man, you are a fool. And you know what? If any man think himself to be wise, let him become a fool. Because you know what? The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Right. Amen. 
And all these man-made logical, rational arguments against Jesus dying for everybody are the foolishness of the world. Yeah. It's nonsense. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. I will prove to you yet again. I mean, we've already proved it sufficiently. Let's prove again that Jesus died for the unsaved. He died for everybody. He died for the lost. Look, if you would, at 2 Peter chapter 2. You say, well, are Calvinists saved? You know, it makes me doubt the salvation of anybody who can look at Hebrews 2, 9 and just not believe it. I mean, look, if somebody walked up to me and said, I believe in evolution, wouldn't you, wouldn't you doubt their salvation? If somebody came to you and said, I believe evolution, wouldn't you doubt their salvation? You'd be like, well, it doesn't sound like you believe the Bible. You know, I mean, you know, you're coming to me and tell me you believe in evolution. That's not what the Bible says. It sounds like you don't believe God's word. And, and then somebody comes to you and says, well, I don't believe Jesus died for everybody. That's, they're not basing that on scripture. They're just basically just denying the word of God. I mean, it, you know, why wouldn't I doubt the salvation of someone who believes this stuff? You know, that's, you say, well, I can't believe you say that. Look, anybody who's saved can understand the word of God. Because the Holy Spirit will guide them into all truth. How can you read the Bible and not understand that Jesus died for everybody? <laughs> you know? So therefore, it, it does make you doubt their salvation. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. They're denying the Lord that bought them. So did Jesus pay for them? But are they saved? Well, look at the last part of verse 3. Their damnation slumbereth not. These people are described in Jude as being twice dead. These people, for them is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Yet the Lord bought them. Yet he paid for their sins because he died for all. Let me just quickly, I'm going to have to skip a point for time. but.